add this to your subscription. Like, are you tired of this flavor? Try this flavor. Like all those types of additional engagement, you're just going to keep somebody on longer and buying from you longer. And that's really the goal with subscriptions is giving customers what they want when they want it. Folks, welcome back to the High Voltage Business Builders podcast. So we're going to unpack some secrets and strategies today for scaling e-com companies, businesses, and brands. As you know, that's what we talk about a lot on here, although we have all kinds of guests. But this gentleman's making waves in the industry for subscription models and content development around that, how to build a sense of community. The guy who's, you know, jokingly says he's funny, but he's not. No, I mean, he's actually really funny. He's a very interesting guy. So you guys are, <laughs> you guys are going to enjoy this combo today. He Don't mistake him as somebody as funny. I think that's what he told me a minute ago. I might have got this completely wrong, but we're here to talk about subscriptions, adding value to your DTC e-com channels. Welcome to the call, Matt. Thank you. No, I just meant it's really funny <laughs> to say I'm not actually funny. I just remind people of someone that's funny. You just remind me of somebody that's funny. Yeah, that's cold, man. That's not being kind at all. If you guys are listening to this, his shirt says be kind on it. So I'm trying to be nice. to me. No, look, if you make me laugh, we'll be friends. And I don't care if you're making fun of me because that if you can't laugh at you, I, I mean, I, I learned a long, long time ago. If you can't laugh at yourself, life is just really long. And there's really yeah, there's laughing at yourself. And then there's what people call self deprecating humor, which sure. you got to be careful how far you take that because then people are like, whoa, you're like, what, yeah. what did he just say? Yeah, you got to have some fun in life. And I do the same thing, too. So well, let's talk about you for a sec. Let's get into some ideas and some concepts around subscriptions and the business of building value and recurring revenue, which is really the biggest component. And obviously you got some things to share with people today. So let's start in just a little bit. So give me your first, you know, three big things, let's say that someone who is in the DTC or e -com market and wants to drive continuous revenue through subscriptions. What's the first three things you want them to know about this? Yeah, so the first three things are gonna come down to, I think, really the main thing is that great subscription programs start with acquisition. They're yeah. actually not a retention strategy at its core. Like retention yeah. is a part of that, but it starts with acquisition. So it comes down to acquiring the right type of customer. And that kind of dovetails into point number two, which is understanding the value that your product actually offers for customers over time, as well as any problems or benefits that they're seeking from that product. Now that might seem really, really simple. And I know we hear that a lot in DDC value, you know, your customer kind of thing, but honestly, that's actually one of the biggest shortcomings I see with brands is that they're not getting really into the weeds under what people really want from that program. And we'll talk more about why that's so important. And I think ultimately the third thing is not overcomplicating it. So great subscription programs are really just an opportunity for engagement. In any business anywhere on the planet since the dawn of time, if you can get greater engagement from your customers, you learn more, you can sell them more, you understand the market better. It just creates a ton of opportunity. It boosts retention, boosts acquisition, all the things. So if we're thinking about great subscriptions as engagement opportunities, it does also kind of change the how we are lensing them. So it gets down into the value of the acquisition right. for a customer. What are you willing to pay for that customer compared to what someone else is willing to pay for them? Obviously providing a good product or service for your subscription. And then obviously providing some customer loyalty or back in or opportunity for them to see continued value and keeping that subscription over right. three, six, nine, 12 months, right? Absolutely. Or what we consider to be more a customer lifetime value. What right. are you shooting for in terms of that loyalty and value? Are you going on a 12 month, 36 month? Where do you value the, the greatest position with subscriptions? And honestly, I think anything getting over a year is pretty, pretty powerful. Yeah. Most, I mean, most subscription programs like have decent churn is like five to 10% a month, which is still actually looking at like you're churning somebody in, in about a year, depending on how you're looking at it. So I think anything that can get over a year is pretty, pretty great. And what does that value to you in terms of what you're targeting or what you see for your clients? Is that a $300, $500, $2,000? What are you shooting for? Yeah. I mean, typically, I mean, like your average order value for e-commerce is around like 50 bucks, which I kind of hate averages because that most people are either the $30 or the 70 or $80. So 50 yeah. is kind of in the middle. So you're, you're, you're typically looking at something that's going to be north of 500. So we're looking at 750 to over a thousand dollars for a lifetime value for a customer. And that's if you aren't good, very good at upsell. So if somebody okay. has an average order <laughs> value of 50 bucks, yep. you should be at month three or month four is when you should start looking at how you can turn that $50 into a hundred dollar month purchase. So if we're looking at that AOV, we're looking at that 500, 750 over 12 months, which platforms, or does it matter to you, which, which 
place that subscription is actually occurring. You know, on Amazon, they're subscribe and say for those who are right. in there. And then there's, of course, DTC subscription based models. What is it? Is it varied by platform for you or is it? it does. I mean, more? I don't have a ton of data related to Amazon stuff because yeah. the clients we typically work with are on WooCommerce or Shopify. And so those that's the data that we see. But I mean, ultimately, it, it really doesn't matter if you feel like you're getting great engagement and value from a customer, you're making money like that's yeah. really what it comes down to. I try to track it in terms of what Amazon tells me for that channel, just from my perspective for a second, is that, you know, for those who might be listening on the Amazon channel side, the subscriptions and subscribe and save opportunity for your products, if you're obviously targeting products of good value that have subscription capabilities, not at one time a year purchase, right. but something that might be bought every month or, you know, two times a year, is to go after Amazon's target, which is literally a prime member with $1,000 a year and spend. Right. Because that's where Prime is. Unbelievable, right? Like, I think that's fascinating that they can do that. They know that. It's, of course, yeah. their model to do that. So we want to get involved in that. Now, how do you do that if you sell a $100 product and you have a subscription that may be $50 a month? Well, you got to do the math, right? Right. You got to be able to target that acquisition. So first acquisition for a product and stuff, what are you willing to pay to grab that first person in the confidence you now have with what you're doing to upsell them and get them into longer term subscriptions? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that is actually a little bit of a trade off, depending on how confident the, or how good the brand is at the upsell opportunity and that engagement yep. standpoint. Like I, I, I always, I mean, we work with a lot of smaller brands where if they're not breaking even on the initial purchase. It it really doesn't make sense because most subscriptions are having coming with a ten or twenty percent initial discount. So I I often look at it like you should be comfortable either breaking even or losing just a little bit of money on the first initial subscription purchase if you know that overall you're you're driving like retention from customers, right? So if like I'm losing twenty percent in month one then I'm willing to lose maybe 20% on most of my orders because that's being offset by the rest of the group that's hitting month two and month three and month four. If, if, if I know I have a really great program, I'm willing to give up more, but, but honestly, the best programs I see aren't operating at losses initially. They're actually like, I mean, there are a lot of really bad stories in the space, like within the fresh food, like that's one of the most popular ones, but some mm -hmm. of the best like subscription box programs and subscription programs are they just get really, really good at knowing their customer. And so that they're not actually like waiting for month six or month seven to be Got it. Bought, bought back on the acquisition cost. So is it possible for any product or service to have a subscription? I think most anything that has any kind of regular consumption related to it, even if that's I mean, I've seen subscriptions for pillowcases, right? So yeah. like, you, you, you know, you should be <laughs> yep. you know, do you know that you should be switching your pillowcase out every year and your sheets like like that's, that's, I've seen. And you hit them with all that. the bacterial to right. reasons and bed bug reasons why down. they need to buy a new one and you freak them out. And so they're like, do they buy two more? Right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then there's things like auto ship for like filters and replenishment, things like that. And then even yeah. within services, I think ultimately like SaaS and digital goods are the, like the forerunners of a lot of subscription services, mm -hmm. well, like mm -hmm. newspapers and magazines and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an opportunity there. If you, again, I always say like it comes from an engagement standpoint. So if, if there's something that I could sell that allows me to engage more with somebody in a way, like if I'm normally selling a $5,000 coaching package and people aren't willing to buy that, but I have a group you can subscribe to for 20 bucks a month and you just get some free knowledge in the group, right? Like I can make an alternate subscription model with something like that, that allows me to then nurture people as leads for my main, my big ticket items. Yeah, downsell or cross sell or upsell based on you know their needs or price points or or right. So I'm gonna throw you a softball or a question a little bit, but I'm gonna switch gears for a second as well. How did you get into subscriptions in the first place? Like, actually, let's go back one layer deeper than that question. Let's go back to Matt personally. Yeah. Did you were you in a, a well-to-do family? Was your dad an entrepreneur? Did you you know was your dad a blue-collar working guy and mom was dad and mom at home? Like, which let's a little bit of your story to give us some insights. As yeah, to my you my parents got are. divorced when I when I was a kid, and that was kind of tough. Growing up in California, everybody that I was around had more stuff than than we did. You know, single mom. So my mom, in a sense, is like an entrepreneur. She had to go back to school. I mean, figure out a career, all those things. For me, it's I've got had some personal stuff in my life that has made it like my own adversity and all things I've had to kind of overcome and work through subscriptions is not the job that I dreamed about as a kid wanting to get into or anything <laughs> like that. I, I mean, honestly, my previous job was I've always loved e-commerce, I should yeah. say. So I've always yeah. loved e-commerce and marketing. And before I got into subscriptions, I was, you know, I was doing stuff for logistics. So shipping related to e-commerce. And I got tired of working for people that I felt like I didn't have a say, enough say in how the business was being run. It was kind of one of those put up or shut up moments. I can be the guy who's always complaining about 
the ownership team or I can be the guy who goes and joins a team and gets it done. And, yeah. Gets it done and be responsible for that. And so I've had to learn first. So yeah, I met the founder of QPilot, David, I was looking for a marketing partner. And so we kind of like that whole dating process of meeting each other, talking vision and QPilot is built from a logistics. So QPilot's a SaaS platform that helps e-commerce companies and it's built from a logistics standpoint. So okay. having a logistics background meant that David and I really understood each other and what the goal was. So that's kind of, yeah, so I've kind of went all in on it because I just love the space, the innovation. For me, it comes down to engagement, the ability to deliver on value, understand what customers are want. There's a lot of data and subscriptions. Yeah, so it's a really cool market. And I think the future of it is really, really exciting. We're, we're in a world where it's becoming, I mean, I pre-ordered some Uber Eats before this recording, so it'll show up when we're done. <laughs> nice. And I think that I think that the future subscriptions are going to be that same yeah. thing where you're going to be yeah. have more control over you can time your deliveries yeah. when you're going to want to get, get them instead of just being like you get it yeah. when you get it kind it's of thing. advancing, so, no doubt yeah. about it. So a question about on the personal and entrepreneurial side, if I might, for a moment. Yeah, of course. What was some of the best advice you got that helped you overcome some of those challenges of not having that you know structure and the family structure to help kind of help support you along the way? What's some of the best advice you got during that? <laughs> yeah, some of the best advice relates to I think an ownership mentality in, in the sense of instead of thinking about waiting for somebody else to figure it out, you need to be the person to figure it out. If you want to do something, like I have a I have a partner who started the business, and so it took me a while to kind of get to this point of where you know, it's still okay for me to just go do it and also tell him, Hey, I think we should be doing this, not this other stuff. And this is yeah. why, and not yeah. wait for him. To, it's not like I'm giving him data so he can make decisions. It's no, I've been looking at all this and this is what I think we should do. This is the opportunity. Like Q pilot started on WooCommerce and we were looking initially at our next integration as Magento. And it took me a while to just, instead of trying to convince my partner that Shopify was better, it was, no, this is what we should do. This is what I want to do. And so that that's one thing. I think the other thing is there, I think there's a little bit of a, I, I don't really like a lot of the entrepreneurship culture where it's like stressing this, how you have to just go hard all the time. Um, <laughs> I have a grind I, mentality. Yeah. I have a running, I have a running background and anybody that's ever done running knows you, you're never going to be as fast as the fastest person. Nope. You can't always train the way other people train. You have to learn what works for you. So for example, my partner, David can sit in one location and work for 12 hours without like blinking or eating. And there's no yeah. effing way I could do that. Right. There's like, people I, of different caliber. No doubt. And the running right. exercise reminded me, I did a 5k one time and I used, I ran about six of them before I got life challenged and forgot to keep going or just didn't right. finish it, which is stupid. I should do it, but I'm about six foot four, almost six foot five. And so I'm moving, I'm good over short distances. Like right. you can't do, I'm just never going to be a marathon runner like some of these guys. Right. And I remember running this race in Joplin a while back, and it was actually a 5K that backed into a 13K as part of a half marathon run. So people were running with us who were also running the 13K. Right. And I remember like huffing it across the 5K line, right? And thinking I'm going to do, I did great in like 32 minutes. And here comes this guy, also 6'5", just thin as a rail, just flying, like just gliding across the ground. Like he had never, like he would go in like 10 more miles, 20 miles, he was going to be fine. And I remember looking at that guy going, man, there are just personal limitations that you're never going to overcome. This dude was just flying. He was like floating across the ground. And, and I'm like, man, that's not me. So right. knowing your place and all of that and, and understanding where you came from, you know, where did you be? And, and the entrepreneurial thing is a funny thing, too, because it's hustle and grind mindset right. that just drives me insane. You made that transition to a business owner mindset somewhere along the line. Where did you go from the entrepreneurial mindset to the business mindset? I mean, really, it comes down to like we, when I first joined QPI, we tried to raise so we were trying to raise outside capital and it didn't work. And so that's kind of where a, a big of that transformative like ideology or understanding of like, you know, there's a greater responsibility for how the business is run. And, and that's the irony where I said I initially left a company because I was tired of feeling like I didn't have input on the decisions. Well, now I have all the input and all the information and understand how hard that is and how stressful yeah. that can be, right? Yes. Because there's other people's livelihoods that are also dependent. It's not just like a fun project that we're doing. Like we have a team. We have people that love their job and want to keep doing that job. And if we screw something up, it's going to adversely affect them as well. I, I think that ultimately the, all, the best advice I got as well as a marketer and as an entrepreneur also comes down to instead of trying to be everything, right? Like when I joined Cube Pilot, we were really obsessed with typical marketing strategies, right? Like, you know, and, but I, my greatest strengths are as a content creator, analyst, research, community builder, engagement, partnerships, things like that. 
So we kind of took a step back at one point and decided, you know, because it's also what happens is, is that's what's energizing to me. It's not mm -hmm. just what I'm good at, but it's what like makes me excited to do my job is talking to you, talking to brands, helping them figure things out. And so when we focus on that as a marketing channel, maybe it's not the fastest way to grow. I don't know if there, if there's other better ways we could be managing the growth of our company, maybe, but these ways work. They work well for me, work well for my partner. And they're also what makes me excited and what I love about my job. So I think yeah. that's some great advice is find what you're passionate about and go in on that. So what was the worst advice on the, on the other side of that coin? What have you heard or something someone yeah, told the, you or bet like on yourself? Like the bet on yourself thing was when I first, the, the, and I say bet on yourself, meaning this idea that we take more risks than what are necessary. Okay. So like I was like transitioning from another job. I joined this company to take less money. And then, you know, I got this nice apartment that I couldn't afford because of that, because I thought, Hey, I'm just going to hustle and just make more money. And what ended up happening is I ran into debt because it took me longer to figure things out than I thought. So right. I think the bad advice is, yeah, the whole bet on the bet on yourself in the sense of like, you're going to take on more risk than maybe what is not necessary. The idea that you could, I really identify with people that are doing side hustles and things like that, because you're working the safe job while you're exploring other opportunities. But there is a tipping point when you need to walk away from the comfortability and go all in on the idea. Just make sure you've got all your ducks in a row when that happens so that you know, don't run out of food or you can keep the lights on and things like that. Yeah, well, tenacity and perseverance are an aspect of any longevity in business, aren't they? Because you can a lot of people can start things. It's finishing right. it. Exactly. It's the most difficult, right? Exactly. So what is it in your life that you feel like you're still finishing, that you're not finished learning, that you're still going to be oh, maybe in progress for the so rest much, of your life? So, so much of all of it, honestly. Like, I, I don't think I've, I've got things going that I think are going well, but I think there's still so much more to figure out. How do you scale that? How, like, you know, a lot of the marketing stuff we're doing, does that work if we were to double in revenue? Like, do we have to change or shift again? There's always, I, I'm a big lifelong learner person. There's nothing, there's never anything that, yeah, that where you've got it all figured out and things just change. So, well, they do. And then change and adaptability is one of the biggest things we can learn to right. do to overcome things and basically persevere, you know, business is nothing. And we joke about this with my partner too, is that it's just nothing but a series of problems you're trying to solve in your business or for the people that you're working with in their businesses or however you do business in that nature. It's just a series of problem solving. Is that, do you agree with that or you I have do. some other input? No, I think I, I, completely. Yeah. Absolutely. Keeping the lights on is one of those things to solve, isn't it? It is. <laughs> <laughs> so in your experience with subscriptions and why are you good at subscriptions? with what you guys are doing, where others might fail in the process? Where, where's the gotchas in creating something in subscription? Yeah, for us, it comes down to flexibility. I think most subscriptions, it, it's a really great space. It's very fluid right now. So I don't want to make it seem like other brands or other software programs aren't doing something similar to us because I think there's a lot of innovation that's happening. But I will say that most subscriptions are typically looked at as being inflexible. They come, okay. you know, they, they show up whenever they, they process, you know, your subscription might say it processes on the first, and then it goes into the slowest, cheapest mail option. And so you get it seven to 10 days later. There's very little control over that, but it's it's changing. So for us, we've Qpilot has always been built around flexibility. So we've our technology is built in such a way that it's really, really easy to swap stuff out. It's really easy to change shipping addresses. It's really easy to see when you're gonna get something and even upgrade your shipping within a subscription portal the way you would be able to on a shopping cart. So there's a lot of stuff that we do around that that I think makes it really, really easy so that people will stick around on subscriptions. And the data we have around that means means this. So if a customer changes their frequency or schedule, um, meaning they want to get it every two months instead of one or every third Thursday instead of every third Wednesday, changing that one time is a $65 increase in AOV, right? So or, or LTV, sorry. And then doing that three times is a 200% increase in LTV. If somebody is starts changing out products and they're trying other things, that's, if you can get somebody to change out a product three times, yeah, 600% increase in LTV. So the engagement increases the lifetime value of yeah. that customer. If you, yeah. And if you just think about it, like for, for me, it's like you make a lot of money on the, on the, in the margins, right. In the sense of you have a core group of your of customers that are just going to stay on the subscription. They're going to be happy, but at some point over the course of months or a year or two, they're going to want to change. Something's going to change whether they've moved their needs, whatever it is. And can they make that really, really easy? And when it's not, 
sometimes they stick around and a lot of times they don't. So just making it just really easy for somebody to change something when they need it, it, it seems so obvious, but it's one of the things that we're seeing is needing to be innovated within subscriptions. And then the, the next level is if I can get other people to try their products, right? Like add this to your subscription. Like, are you tired of this flavor? Try this flavor. Like all those types of additional engagement, you're just going to keep somebody on longer and buying from you longer. And, and that's really the goal with subscriptions is giving customers what they want when they want it. And then yeah. you're learning more and able to sell more mm -hmm. into them. Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, I appreciate that. Some very good insights. So folks, if you are on the direct to consumer side and you're looking, you know, in Shopify, WooCommerce, et cetera, you've got a product, physical product or digital product, and you're looking to increase the value, the lifetime value of that customer, definitely check out the links below or above this video, depending upon which platform you're on. Please like or subscribe. So give some love and engagement. Appreciate that. Well, if you have any questions for Matt, those links will be in there on contact information. As you can tell, he obviously has been in this for a long time and knows his stuff. And if you want to drive more customer lifetime value, better engagement and more sales and profit, Check out what he's doing. Get into the subscription game. Could be a game changer for you guys in the Absolutely. next year. Absolutely.